Sammy. Everybody knows who that's from, right? Mission Impossible, right? Am I, I don't think I've seen the newest one, the two-parter, but I have not seen that. Because we're talking about, as I've been saying for the last two weeks, and this week is the third, our mission for 2024. The pastor will say this, and you are the family of God, and you repeat after this, follow the little script. The pastor says, our task for 2024 is Acts 2024. The task is testifying to the good news of God's grace. That was weak. The task, Acts 2024. The task is testifying to the good news of God's grace. I hope the people watching on Facebook said the same thing. So we have a task that's before us. The interesting thing is, and, and I started thinking this week, the task hasn't changed, right? When I, when I first became pastor at One Accord, and uh, even before we started Hope Weaver, when I was sitting with my pastor in Georgia, we were sitting there talking about things, and I said, what are some of the struggles that I'm going to have as a new pastor? Um, things getting ready, you know, we talked about a little bit of everything. He actually gave me an Excel spreadsheet with 289 things I had to complete before starting the church. I think I got two of them, but we, we, we got it going. <laughs> I had people tell me, the experts say, well, you need to raise $100,000 and wait a two-year waiting as you grain support. And I said, the Lord called me now, and I started, and we've been going for 17 years. Amen. So God has blessed us and kept us together. Uh, as guests of ours, you're going to see, there are people like Isabel we prayed for. She's been with me for 16 years. Her son, where's Randy? Raise your hand, Randy. Randy was named after Pastor Randy, so that's my, that's my little buddy right there, Randy. Uh, that's how long they've been together. We've been together for a long time. And I preached, I don't know, do the math, I'm not going to do it. Billy could do it real quick, 16, 17 years. I didn't do every Sunday, but you think about it, that's quite a few, right? That's a few. And the, the task that we have hasn't changed since the day we started the church. It never has, and guess what? It never will. That's right. You're thinking about it, and as we said earlier, and Miss Diane brings it up every Sunday, and it's something we never need to get off of our lips. We pray for our loved ones and those who are not yet saved. I put a big yet in there, and I always have to say that because I don't want to ever say that, you know, you can't exclude them. They're not yet saved. Aren't you thankful that somebody prayed for you when you were not yet saved? We think about our days and our lives, and you can go back and go, man, I was not saved. And I'm thankful that God was still God, and people still prayed for me when I was not yet saved. So the task hasn't changed. So I almost feel like the, my teacher's in the room. How many times have I taught you this? We've gone over this and over this and over this, and why do we need to keep going over it? Because that's what we're supposed to do as God's people. We need to continue to focus. How many of you lose focus? My was Melissa, be good, girl. We'll see ya. God bless. All right. <laughs> there you go. God is good all the time. So we still have a task before us, and I'm going to continue to remind you of that. The task for us is to testify to the good news of God's grace. Last week, after I did that the first week, we talked about the time for the task. When's the time for the task? Now. now. Right now. I can remember, and I, I, God is perfect in His timing. When I decided or felt like I was, when we first got into ministry at Eastside Coppers Cove, Kimberly was my Bible study teacher. I hadn't been to seminary or felt a calling. I just needed to get my wife and son to church. That's, that was the only calling I got this Sunday morning. What do we do? We don't want to watch ABC or any of up with people I watched when I was a kid. We were supposed to go to church. So we found a church. Pastor came to the house, sold the deal. We joined church. Well, they realized that she was like a Bible expert. And she's an amazing Bible teacher. And so they made her a Bible teacher. People would be like, oh, she's a woman. I'm like, she's an amazing Bible teacher. That let's Don't look at the gender. Look at what she can pull out and pour out because of what God's done. And so I became part of her Bible study. And then they're like, okay, you can be the education pastor. And then they heard her sing. And they're like, Randy will be the worship pastor and raise his hand and wave his hand while she sings. And I can remember that whole time thinking, look, as it's going along, God is moving in ways and people would say, you need to be a pastor. And I'm like, no, no, it's not the time. God was clear on the time. The exact same day that I felt a calling on my life and I called her from Virginia. I was staying up in Virginia 
um, actually Maryland, but between Maryland and Virginia. And I called her and I said, guess what? And she had that wife already knows kind of answer. What? And I said, I've been called. I told you. I've been telling you for a while. Well, God just spoke to me and he said, listen, what you're going to do, you're going to go to seminary. And the day you graduate seminary, that month, you're going to leave and you're going to go start a church. And we did exactly like that. God's timing is perfect. Perfect. We argue a lot of times with God's timing. Amen. Amen. When we lose someone, it's too soon. You don't know what the rest of the life is. You don't know the rest of the story. Only he does. One of the greatest consolations that we'll ever have and understand is that below the age of accountability, and I believe this is biblical, is that below the age of accountability, if you don't know right from wrong, if you pass away, you go to heaven with God because he wants everyone in there. It's about choices, and his timing is always perfect. So if the time for the task is now, we need to be about it. And I said last week, I said it on my Wednesday night, and I had people trying to guess. I said, we're going to do some of that alliteration or whatever, right? We're going to do another T. And people text me with what the T should be. Well, God gives me the T. You don't give me the T. But the time for the task is now, but we need to understand the target <coughs> for the task. If you don't understand or know what the target is, say it and spray it. There are a lot of people that will stand before you and they'll preach the word of God and they're just spraying out. They will go through and, and list every nugget scripture they've ever known. They will go through and just say things, and you're like, where's this going? That's confusing. As a teacher, you can't just get up there and go, today we're going to study math, and I'm going to give you every math that I know. You can't. Language arts, you can't go up there and say, we're going to go over all the parts of speech. You can't do all. You've got to show them that they understand and know the target. We talk about, when we read the, the good news of God's grace, we've equated that to the gospel. Did you know that each one of the gospels, there's four of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The reason why they're in that order is not by age or when they were written. That's just when they decided in 333 AD or whatever the Bible, they were going to put them in that order. <laughs> but each one of them has a specific audience. I always wondered, and if you think about it, if you look at the Bible and you say, why do you need four events about Jesus? Four, four books that just talk about the gospel message. It's that important. We need to say it four times. Not only is it that important, but each book was written to a certain audience that would understand it and hopefully receive it. As I was getting ready for this week, one of the things it asked you to do, or I was looking up, what are the audiences of the gospel? And it started talking about churches coming up with your target audience. How do you define your target audience as a church? Well, Kimberly and I sitting on a beach in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, when we came up with the name for this church, we were down there for a week with our pastor and his wife, and we're an all-inclusive, and we sat out in the hammocks one morning, and we came up with the name for the original name, Weaver of Hope, and then it changed to Hope Weaver. And, and we said, what is our church going to look like? And if anybody knows me, I, here's what I saw it as. Rock and roll, pyrotechnics, my stage in the round that's spinning way too fast like the bad Saturday Night Live skit. And, and I'm going through all of this in my head. And I thought about Plant City. Well, we didn't even know we were going to come to Plant City, but that's where I knew churches from. And this is, we were living in Georgia. Atlanta's got a hot, lot of hotbed churches like that. And I was sitting there going, this is what we're going to look like. So we did a demographic search of Plant City. We knew that our congregation would be between the ages of 28 and 35 with two and a half kids. I always wonder about that little half kid. He's so small. It's like you're just a half a child. But two and a half kids where both mom and dad were working. And we kind of were supposed to develop our church based upon that demographic. Look around. That is really not who we ended up being. It seems like every time we try to come up with our own tar target, God would say, just let me do it. The gospel is written in four versions and four ways and four tones of voice so that everybody can hear it. And it's for everybody. So we're going to go over the four. And I hope before the day's over, you get two things out of this message. One, which target are you for? You need to kind of focus your target. And which group are you in? If it was targeted to four different groups, there's four different people sitting in here today, possibly. 
The first one is the book of Matthew. Matthew 5 and 17 shares this verse. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. This is Jesus speaking, but Matthew was highlighting the scripture. That Jesus didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. This was a focus of the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew was written to religious leaders. Religious people. There was a time where all the, the biggest religion, obviously, God's people were the Jewish people, and there were the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the leaders of the religion. Well, all of a sudden, he needed to reach them, and Matthew spoke to them, and because Jesus came on the scene, and everybody's like, what's this guy doing? He's a liar or a lunatic, Bible will say. And you're looking at him, and they said, is he crazy, or is he actually speaking? Why does he go around calling himself, I am? The blasphemous name. You can't say those words out. Why is he choosing that? Because they needed him to know that you as religious leaders need to be reached as well. I equate that in 2024. That's to pastors. But it's also to people who are in the church. Do you realize that you have people in the church that are lost? What? No. At our school, when we talk about athletics, and I'm the athletic director, one of the things we always talk about is recruiting the hallway. We're not allowed to recruit in high school, but going and getting those, not outside the building, but those are actually there. Why not reach them first? Guess what? They're already there. A lot of times, and I, and I don't say this, but I know this, and I'm not trying to put it down, but a lot of times a church you will sit in and they're telling you where you need to go. On this Sunday, one day you need to go to this mission field. You need to go here and you should be out there and you should be on, on this trip and this group. And all of a sudden I'm looking, I'm like, we need to talk to the people that are sitting in the chairs. That Jesus came along on the scene, not to get rid of the law or the Old Testament, but he came to fulfill all of that. As a new covenant, New Testament church, we don't just... We don't look at the Old Testament. Yeah, we do. The greatest quote ever is that the Old Testament is the new. The New Testament is the Old Testament, or Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You go through the whole Old Testament, you study it by itself, and you're like, those Jewish people messed up over and over and over. But for what reason? They were God's chosen people and on the same thing, Jesus. And so we need to understand today that one of our targets for this year are you. We should know, and as a pastor, I would love to be able to just, without a doubt, say that everybody in my church is 100% saved and they're going to heaven. That's a great comfort. Not knowing drives me crazy. I know, where's Miss Betty and Miss Diana and Miss Sherry not here with us any longer, but... I know that I'm going to do some of your funerals. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Diana's going to get one thing out of this whole thing. <laughs> Better ready to do my funeral. Don't have to ask anybody else. Don't ask anybody else. I got you. My very first funeral was my dad's. First one I ever preached. The last one I've had to do was my mom's. And you're sitting there going, how and why? That's what God's called me to do. I don't want anybody else to do them. But I need to know and I want to be able to celebrate. When we say we're having a celebration for your life, I don't want to go in there saying we're lying. I want to say you lived a life. I've told this story before. A lot of times the way they, visit or the way they look at churches and say, how well are you doing on your mission? They look at you and say, how many people did you go out and baptize? And I always argue. What if every one of my church members was 100% saved, they've all been baptized, and they all have their own ministry? Doing pretty well. You all have your own ministries, but your target needs to be first. That was, that was 23, right? 23 and me. Book of Matthew. Book of Mark comes along. He writes, it's actually the first written of the four Gospels. He's writing to converts. New people who are new believers... After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, the gospel. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. They're being converted into something new. That, and then as they're going and moving along, John the Baptist is on the scene. And as he's out there preaching and teaching, there are some people that are brand new to understanding Jesus. 
And not just knowing Him. A lot of times we think because you join the church and you're on a, maybe you're in a Bible study that you've got it. No, you have to repent and believe the good news. Don't be converted by your attendance. Be converted by your repentance. Kimberly always says, I say, and they'll be like, there, that'd be a snapshot. If I, Jennifer used to do it, I'd be like, don't understand that you just came to church, but you need to believe in the church. The church is the foundation on Jesus Christ. If you don't believe that, you're just showing up for a club event. Keep coming. I have no idea whether or not Melissa walked in here and, and, and is a believer in Jesus Christ. Great example. She walked into our building as soon as we unlocked the doors and she was cold. Byron said it was sad to watch how cold her feet were. She sat in here from 8 to 11 with us. Didn't preach to her one time. I didn't baptize her. I didn't put holy water on her. I didn't slam her on the front of the pulpit and say, you will repent now. All we did was love her. Why? Because I believe that God is still about His good news and His business. And all I have to do is repent and be about what I'm supposed to do. Converts, new believers, we've got quite a few of you. You need to understand, thank you for coming, that's great. But really believe and receive Him. The book of Mark reached out to those who were newly converted. Luke reaches most of the people. Luke is the most prolific writer in the New Testament. You're going to say, Paul wrote a bunch. Luke wrote more words because he gets Luke and Luke 2, which we call Acts. The most written words in the New Testament came from Dr. Luke. And he wrote this. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly, talking about timely, orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. He wanted to know that those who were seeking this new understanding understood to where it went. Matthew, I said, wrote to the Jews. Mark wrote to the Romans because they were being converted into Judaism. And all of a sudden you get um, Mark come, Luke comes on the scene and reads, writes to the Greeks. He was a doctor. You always go to the doctor's office and they have stuff written up there you can't understand. It's either Greek or Latin. Um, this was Luke. And he said to them, I need to make certain that you know what you're about to get yourself into. There are a lot of churches out there that call them seeker cells or seeker churches. And they do very specific targeted um, services to get somebody who doesn't know to come and accept. And that's as far as they go. That is wonderful because it is about salvation. But let me tell you, it's about the growth and perfection God has for you in your life. If you go to a secret service as a believer in Jesus Christ over and over, you're like, you're not talking to me. I've got it. I am okay with being in a secret church if you're seeking Jesus' will for your life. Don't seek to come and understand Pastor Randy. I said this, and I think I said it in my sermon a couple weeks ago. About a month ago, we were talking, and I said, that pastor says crazy things. And my wife chimes in, you say crazy things. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I'm okay as long as I am doing my best to guide you with this in mind. Carefully investigate everything from the beginning. If I say something that's not scriptural or wrong, please let me know. I used to have someone who would tell me every week something else, and I would have to defend it. I'm like, thank you. That was, that's not what I said. My wife will say, you know you said, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know I, I say everything. I want you, the reason why, and I will tell you, the reason why we have men's Bible study and women's Bible study and now a singles ministry and we have a Wednesday night is to go a little bit deeper and go to that next opportunity. My men's group that has been going on, I don't know how many years, for a long time now, has three or four churches represented on Tuesday night. And we gather together, we get in the Word, and we study it like our life depends upon it, because it does. Carefully, an orderly account, Luke wanted everyone to know that if you're seeking, you need to have understanding. Because if you're seeking and you don't gain understanding, you're not going to stick. If it doesn't hit the target, it's worthless. If 
you all launch, anybody watch Reacher? If you launch a rocket missile and it doesn't hit the target, it's not worth its weight and money. It's not worth it. If every time I shot and I missed, I wouldn't be a very good at what I do. We're the military. We shoot all the time, but we don't hit anything. That's not good. That's the 18. Remember, they never shot anybody on the 18. Back in our days, they weren't allowed to shoot people on, on TV. You weren't. They weren't. They never shot anybody. They shot at people, but they never shot anybody. I was like, how do you shoot that? They're the worst people ever, the A-team. They used to be the D-team. They ain't hit anything in a while. We need to be seeking Jesus Christ in everything we do. We do it well on Sundays. Y'all make up a pretty good church group on Sunday. Y'all look nice. Y'all act nice to one another. You get donuts. You get juice and coffee. We, we sing. It's just a nice day. But I hope you know it's more than just a nice day. It's the start of your week. It's the start of you going. Guess what? I have you way less time than anybody else does. Your job has you more time. TV has you more time. Some of you, TikTok has you one more, way more time than me. There are a lot of people that have it. I wasn't looking at anybody specific on that. But there are a lot of things that have you more time than you. I have you. And so I've got to be about God's business and make sure you understand that we're hitting the target. The last book. Thankfully, this book came along called John. If you don't understand it, if you're a new believer, or if you have somebody in your family that's new, and they come to you and they say, hey, I'm, I'm brand new to this church thing, and I want to read the Bible, where do I start? Put them in John. John goes through, and it, it doesn't go through the Jesus story like the rest of them. It doesn't go through the birth. It just says in the very beginning was God, and they were with God, and the Word was God. And it goes through, and it starts right there. The established authority of Jesus Christ. But John was written to everyone. How do we know? Because the greatest scripture in the church world came out. John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his Son, the only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. I need you to know that eternal life, like I said earlier, begins at the moment you believe and receive him fully. I have already started my eternal life. It won't look like this. Thank God. If I had to live like this for all eternity, oh, I'd not, second thought, second thoughts there. I don't want to be this for all eternity. I love you, baby. Thank you, baby. <laughs> Lord, heal her. I don't want to go on for all eternity. <laughs> for God so loved the world. And John, he didn't know it when he penned that, but that would probably be the greatest scripture to summarize the gospel and the task that we have. It really goes through and tells us who to reach the whole world. Why? Because God, in his decision and plan, gave us his son so that we can have eternal life and continues. That's the time. But most of us stop right there. We don't follow the rest of the verses. John also wrote right after this in verse 17. The gospel, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I used to take kind of, not offense, but I used to kind of take ear to the fact when people would say, well, I don't want to be a Christian because I have to give up so much. I'm not ready to be one of those yet. Although you were created to be one of those from the very conception of your life. You would not exist if God did not create you. But I'm not ready to be one of those. I think about all the things I gave up. I gave up. I got kids. In, I gave up being sick on Sunday mornings, I can tell you that. <laughs> Spent a lot of time in college in the military. Sunday mornings were not good mornings up in Gainesville. They were, David, they were tough mornings. You would say, well, why didn't you go to church while you were in college? I couldn't make it to church on Sundays when I was in college. I missed out on that. I think about, and I think about, my father-in-law said it to me one time, dad said it to me, and I, 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 I thought about, you think about where all your money in your life has gone. Woo! Man, I could have two gladiators had I not wasted my money on the stupid things of this world. I missed out on being scared. Because I might be in trouble. I don't know if those lights are for me or not. I missed out on having to defend myself to try to remember what I said or didn't say. That's ridiculous. That's, that's what I'm missing out on. 
as I've sold out my life and believed fully in Jesus Christ, I don't miss out on anything. I don't. Will you miss out on a good time? No, I don't miss out on a good time. I had a great time last night. My wife, we sat and watched a movie. She fell asleep in 30 minutes. But we watched the movie together. I love sitting in my recliner at my house, Amen. knowing good and well what's happening and what's about to happen. And when I wake up in the morning, I know everything that I've got going on. That's a beautiful thing. And I know my mom and dad are in heaven. I know when my brother asked for prayer over his kidneys, he's going to heaven. I asked him that a long time ago. I know that my in-laws, my wife, my son, my grandmothers, never met one of my granddads, but I know my granddad, Pastor, uh, granddaddy Kent is there. I know where most of you are going. I spend as much focused time with you than any other group. I work at school, but I'm kind of running around in the offices out of school when I'm not there. You are my family. And I know you're going to be in heaven. And I am thankful that when his son came, he didn't condemn any one of us. He gave us life and he gave it abundantly. This is the good life. Amen. A life with God is a good life. You know how much I spent on New Year's Eve this year? Nothing. But I was fully entertained by hearing karaoke for Captain Cole. <laughs> Seeing DJ dress for every song that he sang, whether it was country or just not country. <laughs> if he had a hat on, it was country. If it was not a hat, it was not country. Listen, guys, this is the good life. If you believe fully and understand what Jesus did for you and what he's doing for you right now and what he's already established for you, you are living your best life as long as you're living for Christ. That's the bottom line. I don't like my job. Live for Christ. I don't get along. I don't have enough money. Live for Christ. He didn't condemn us. He saved us. Verse 18, he says this at the end. Here's the, here's the onus that's placed on us. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. A lot of times they will say as a church, as a religion, Christianity is exclusionary. I'm here to tell you this day, the truth is in his word is that there's only one choice. There's no fence line. There's no, hey, I'm, I'm right in the middle and I'm, I'm going to see how these two things work out. He says you're either with me and if you're fully with me, then you're fully, fully blessed and you have eternal life. But if you're not with me and you have not believed in me and you do not receive me, then you are condemned for all eternity. Let me clear up something. The Bible doesn't just say that we have eternal life. Those who do not believe will live for eternity. It's just separated from God. And that is horrible. So if that is what he's saying, and that is clearly the mission that we have, then we cannot miss the target. We can't. We can't say, well, a bad shot. No, we can't. None of you, I don't believe in reincarnation, so you don't get a second shot. Not biblical. Well, what? No, you don't. The saddest thing is for many of you, when you meet somebody or you have an interaction with somebody, even your own family members, that might be the only shot you get. I didn't take it. I was. No. We don't have the cushion to miss the target. Life with Jesus or without. Is where we're at. We have a responsibility and we've got to be about what he's called us to do. You can bring home the bacon. <laughs> oh, you have to do the rest of it for me? <laughs> be focused. Here's what I'm telling you. And I don't usually speak words like this. You don't have a choice. Your free will is to choose him. Or not choose him. Once you've chosen him, you're commanded to follow and do as he's called you to do. And he did that so that you would understand the abundant life he has set aside for you. Yeah, I don't feel good every day. My shoulders kill me. 
Sometimes Kimberly gets up or she says, you walk like an old man. I am an old man. I feel like an old man. I still say, well, I can do that. And then I look at him like, ah, I can't do that. We went on a cruise and we're like, oh, let's do excursions. There's not many excursions that are negative skill level or energy level. They're always one through four. We can't do four anymore. We can't do three. We're too beat up to do two. Let's do zero. Listen, short time on this earth. When I was in the military, and this will close it, when I first joined the Army, I, somebody told me early on, set small, obtainable goals. It's something that stuck in mind. When they came to me as a pastor and they said, give us your five-year plan, I said, I'll give you a five-day plan. Let me give you that. Small, obtainable goals in your life. I can do this when you're out on deployment. You would say, I can do this for the next 30 minutes. Stay away. Remember, the disciples couldn't stay away for the 30 minutes, but he's asking me to stay away. And then all of a sudden, I can do it for a day. I can do it for a month. In our careers, George has already said what retirement's going to look like at year one of working for the, for the district. I'm just trying to get to the end of this year. Then I'll see what the next year looks like. Small, obtainable goals. You need to start and understand that, that this is a small portion of your eternal life. Small. We're going to look back after we've lived with Jesus for a million years ago. <laughs> Those first 70 or 80 were there. They were nothing. But we've got to be about his business. We have a task. The time is now. And we must hit the target. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for clearly guiding us, calling us. Lord, I've always respected commanders that clearly gave the order. Well, you've clearly given us our orders. You've given us to us in various forms and fashions, Lord God. You've given us to us through the word of God, through the unction of the Holy Spirit, through the worship and praise of your son, Jesus Christ. You continue to give us the same mission to reach those who don't know you, to grow in our own understanding to develop relationships with you like no, never before, and to go and do and say in your name. Lord, I am truly thankful and blessed today that you've called us. May we be a church about your business. May we be a family about building the family and the kingdom of God. May we love others even when they're just cold. May we reach others who truly need to understand. We thank you for all of this. For we pray it and ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.